um, if you aren't already, go to the cover.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome to at. Uh, good evening, everyone. Our traditional streaming problem at the first second of our live stream. Uh, we just had it, so now we can continue. Good evening, uh, and welcome to a, at another episode of the. Um, Entrepreneur's Kitchen. I'm really happy. This week looks like the week of the arts. Uh, we had Landon Ross and yesterday two cultural entrepreneurs, a cartoon artist, and today I have another artist as my guest. Uh, I'm very proud to say that he's also a sonophilian, uh, Simon Zabel or Simon Zabel. He's a British Spanish artist living in uh, Spain in Granada. So please welcome Simon. Hi Simon, how are you doing? Hello. Hi. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me into your kitchen. Thanks oh, thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 have you, you have been to our kitchen, no? When you were visiting Salzburg, did we have the Actually, possible? No. No. no, no well, this is the first time. Mm, this is at my least first virtually. Time. Welcome. Exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. So Next time. Seat. <laughs> Next time we'll do a big dinner. Um, Simon, does your t-shirt say something we should know? Ah, <laughs> I, I did at one point know what it says. It's in reference to the baseball player who's on the t-shirt. Oh, okay. That, <laughs> the, the, that was his motto, was something like the, the golden lion or something like that. Oh, I okay. Don't remember exactly. <laughs> but um, it's actually uh, one of my many... Uh, Obsessions is the Big Lebowski, and it's actually worn by the Big Lebowski in the film. Oh, yeah, well, Big Lebowski. I, I, I used oh, to do I used to do three ingredient um, cocktails here, white Russians. <laughs> white Russians, okay. Oh, so every time I come to the kitchen, I'll be one thing yeah. the rest. Absolutely. Um, so I just didn't yeah. want to miss, uh, you know, if there's a statement on your on your uh, sweater that we should know. But um, okay, so it's just a baseball reference. Um, Simon, yeah. you're in Spain. How's life in Spain right now for you? Uh, usually, I would say life in Spain is great, but right now, um, <laughs> as everybody knows, it's uh, interesting times, and um, mm. life in Spain is strange, just like it is everywhere. I guess this is like five weeks lockdown now mm. in my house and uh, I was halfway or not even halfway through my semester of teaching sculpture at the University of Granada and uh, just from one day to the next I said okay everybody go home <laughs> and find a way to carry on teaching from home so uh, teaching sculpture from home sounds like a bit of a joke but it's actually, it's actually <laughs> working so, one thing that's strange for me, well, everything is strange. Kind of bombarding you with things to do in case you're bored. <laughs> in these five weeks, I've been everything but bored. I've not been bored for one second. I've got teaching, I've got my own artwork, I'm learning to play a musical instrument, um, I've got my children's homework also to do at home. So, far from being bored, I, I'm like missing hours in the day. So it's being strange. I just miss going out and doing sports. And yeah. then, of course, uh, Spain is being hit particularly hard by the virus. Yeah. So it's, Spain is a, usually a very happy country, but right mm -hmm. now it's kind of a, it's a very sad country. We mm -hmm. go out at 8 o'clock in the evening and everybody chats and sings songs and that and uh, try and keep things happy. But it's uh, every, I think everybody's worried not just about their elderly, because Spanish people are crazy about their elderly. And um, but worried about what's going to be left of the country and of the economy and of everybody's job when when we eventually go back mm -hmm. go back to the world. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know. Maybe we live in interesting times, as somebody once said. Yes, exactly. I think that was also the motto of the Venice Biennale this year. No, may you live yeah, in exactly. interesting times. Yeah, I'll stop saying it to myself. Every time I watch the news and that, it's, may you live in interesting times. Apparently, it's yeah. a curse. Well, <laughs> in England, they, they call it the Chinese curse. Oh, really? It's a kind of way of cursing somebody without them knowing. So it's very nice to meet you. Maybe you live in interesting times. Oh, you know, okay. Well, 
We've been cursed globally. It's basically been boring times. <laughs> well, uh, not to be boring in this in this show, um, I am going to mention that people can also ask questions via Twitter. So please okay. um, just add reply to at the Mindshift TV if you have any questions for uh, Simon and for the show. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, from you. What's that? The question is not too difficult. Please. Not yeah. Well, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> well, you yeah, know, yeah. It, it, this isn't your average audience. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> exactly. Well, Simon, but when you when you think about um, this being pushed into a new kind of um, you know form of life, um, as an artist, how do you experience this challenge? What do you do with it? When you say, you know, now the students have to do uh, sculpture at home with the stuff they find. How do you deal with that kind of challenge? Um, in a way, I think like, being an artist is never easy. But you do get stuck in a kind of rut. If you work on big, large-scale paintings and that, you do one after another and you continue doing large-scale paintings. And sometimes there's always one somewhere in your head thinking one day maybe I should do some little drawings or I should work with little bits and pieces which I find at home. But you never actually do it because you, you've got to keep the, you've got to feed the monkey, you've got to keep the ball rolling. <laughs> so in, in a way I think it's good. Okay, now I can't do large scale paintings. I can't even go to my studio. I'm stuck in my house. But I have to continue working as an artist. So this is forcing me into doing things which I would never have done before, mm. which I think is always a, a good thing for an artist. So in a way, yeah, there's there's some positive in these interesting times. <laughs> we keep saying, we keep saying. So, but um, also we have to talk about the food, you know, not only doing uh, you know, sculpture work at home, but also we have to prepare the food. So what are you going to do? Ah, what am I going to do? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm a better artist than cook. Which is <laughs> My wife is Spanish and she's an amazing cook, not just Spanish food, but international. So we kind of um, specialized in this family. My wife does the cooking, I do the eating. <laughs> Maybe, because I'm, I'm very good at eating. But uh, she did. T she has taught me to do a few dishes, and one of my specialities is uh, is Thai curry. Ah. So I have all my vegetables ready to go ahead with the Thai curry, which will not be the uh, famous green curry, but a masama, which is a yellowy brown curry, which is my favourite, with uh, coconut and peanuts and um. So I'll, I'll do my best. Good. <laughs> well, <laughs> since, since, you know, the, the one good thing about this show is that you get to eat your food yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's very selfish of you. <laughs> well, no, the thing is, it's also self-protection. <laughs> yeah, okay. In this, yeah, this. Like maybe it's the best way right now. Yeah. <laughs> or exact, or, or or protecting my guests from the you know from the disasters. Uh, a couple of days ago, I tried out a quinoa pudding, but obviously you have to do something. You have to prepare quinoa in a certain way, otherwise it leaves yeah. out a lot of bitter bitter stuff. So so it was horrible. <laughs> you shouldn't so, yeah. say that. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know. I'm sure I'm good on screen. Yeah, well, this is this is entrepreneur's kitchen, so it's also an experimental uh, kitchen, okay. you know. So you you do something with whatever you find in your in your uh, in your kitchen, in your uh, you know drawers, etc. Um, well, again, when you when when we were preparing the talk um, a couple of minutes ago before we started, um, you said you are now forced not only into different. Um, uh, genres and to different, you know, um, types of, of materials, uh, but also the the subjects, of course, are different ones. And you mentioned the book project you're doing with uh, your students. How did that? What, what are you guys doing actually with the book? What are they doing? Well, um, 
See, this, this is, I had to do a very big shift because I teach sculpture. So we, we work in big workshops and we mm -hmm. have, well, welding equipments. We have a foundry, we have ovens for ceramics. So, and all of a sudden, um, on a Thursday, they said, go home. And on Monday, you need to have some, something ready to keep these guys going. We're sending all the students home. So um, obviously nobody was ready for this. Mm -hmm. So I had a few days to think about it. And then I think for the first week, I was kind of acting as a psychologist more than a sculpture, <laughs> a sculpture <laughs> instructor. Because the students were in a state of shock and mm -hmm. they've been sent home and they're very worried. And there was a rumor going around that uh, because at that time, Spain was still, the virus hadn't really exploded, but Italy had. And we had lots of Erasmus students from Italy. So there's a rumor going around that they could have been massive contagion in my, in my school for the Erasmus students. So everybody was very worried. So I didn't go straight into the, into the sculpture. We were kind of... Um, uh, I had kind of group therapy Sorry. for the first few days, no worries. <laughs> and then, um, and then, so I just thought, okay, what, what, what things do you guys have at home? And they mm -hmm. said, basically nothing, because they're not even at home, as in their family homes, but in students, red, students either residencies or shared apartments, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on. So, so I just said, okay, well, we have to work from basically nothing. So I said, okay, so everybody, my first idea, because we were working at, uh, funnily enough, we were working on some sculptures which were going to be based on paintings by Edward Hopper. Uh -huh. Well, actually, on text by poet Mark Strand, who based, the text which are based on paintings by Edward Hopper. And as you know, uh, Edward Hopper's paintings are famous for having people who are very lonely or alone mm -hmm. in the kind of, loneliness of the modern world and staring into space and into nowhere and all of a sudden we were all thrown into this reality where you're sent home and said okay you can't leave your house so you mm -hmm. spend hours being on your own and just staring out of the window or staring into space so mm -hmm. it was quite amusing that all, all of a sudden all of my students were turned into characters out of Hopper paintings so mm -hmm. my first idea was say okay everybody has books being mm. students you know, their books so i said okay so i prepared some ideas about books and i said let's work on the book as an object you may mm. have to sacrifice a book or maybe more than one if you need to cut it into pieces whatever yeah. or maybe just order them or put them in strange places and see what we can do from a sculptural point of view with a book and it's actually they're working on this now and there's been some amazing ideas we're that just is... using books and bringing the text into, uh, bringing the, the content, so to speak, of the book, bringing it to life and giving it shape by folding pages and hanging books from the ceiling and things like that. And we're having some amazing results. So that, that sounds great. so fascinating. By the way, this, yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. So oh, which, I'm, is? which is a banana, some oatmeal and cacao. So oatmeal and cacao. And then you just, you know, mash it and then mm -hmm. you bake it for like 15, 17 minutes in the oven. And then you have this banana fudgy oatmeal bar thing or, you know, whatever shape you can put it into. It's kind of, it looks like, it's, it's looked like, um, you know, as if someone, uh, wait, someone had a hangover thing, but. <laughs> yeah, it tastes better than it looks. <laughs> <I'd> never... <laughs> It definitely does. But I mean, this must be particularly fascinating for you because you're also an artist who works with uh, text a lot. Um, so let's let's talk about that. What is what is your fascination? What is the type of work um, um, you actually do? So I, I know it, but lots of people don't. So yeah. Well, I, um, I'm kind of frustrated musician and, and frustrated <laughs> writer. So in a way, I'm, I'm a visual artist, I'm a painter, I'm a, sculptor, I'm a sculptor, but I'm always working as if I was a musician or as if I was a writer. And I've mm -hmm. based nearly all of my work on things that have been previously created by other people in other media. In other media. 
-hmm. as in writings or music, sometimes films do. So I think that's probably what defines me as an artist and as a, well, in general, my life, the idea of translating things from one medium to another. Mm -hmm. and, uh, not, there's one thing, and this is something I've worked on always as an artist and something that I've always uh, forced my students into working on in, well, forced them in a, in a good sense, and they're, they're usually quite, quite grateful that I did it, is that you can't have an idea out of nothing, mm. out of nowhere. I think there's a misunderstanding about what creativity actually is. Mm -hmm. And the word original, people think you know, for something to be creative, it needs to be original. And original means it need, it's in its origin. And if it's mm -hmm. in its origin, it's coming from nowhere else. And I think, you know, language is, is so useful, but it leads us into these mental kind of corners and you get stuck in a corner. Okay, I need something original. So it has to be in its origin. If it's related to something else, it's not in the origin. And things just don't work like that. Mm -hmm. As far as I, as I can see, no artist has ever created anything out of nothing. Um, so uh, I think everything comes from something previous. It's just a transformation. It's as if all human creation was like one big flow of mm -hmm. energy and ideas, which is a buildup of hundreds of generations. And in a way, anybody who wants to create will just take something out of the flow and modify it or update it or adapt it to today's necessities and then throw it back into the flow and the flow just keeps going. Mm -hmm. This is how I kind of view creativity, not as something being in, in the origin, being original in the true sense. Yeah. So and I think I've kind of done a lot of campaigning that we change our idea regarding this, like the idea of self-expression. Mm -hmm. I think art is self-expression, but mm, something not being totally original doesn't uh, subtract from it being a form of self-expression. Mm -hmm. It can even add to it being a form. So I've worked, um, like if I get fascinated by a, by a book or by a, the creations of another artist, I'll work by translating what they've done into my, my own visual medium. But is it like I want to create a language and then write a novel in that language? I'm not happy with English or Spanish in my case. So first I want to create a language and then I want to write a novel, so mm -hmm. to speak. So I guess this has been the basis of my own work as an artist and also my teaching to, to translate things. Like I grew up bilingual. Mm -hmm. I grew up where we spoke English at home and then we went to school in Spanish. So you're continually, your brain is going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And in, I grew up in a large family. And, kind of, and in a way, the, one of the bases of the humor that we had in my family was to do literal translations of things from one language to another. So we'd be speaking in English and we'd say, oh, the neighbor just came around and, oh, what did he say? He said, and you would say in English, literally what he said in Spanish. <laughs> so that would be funny, of course, because languages, <laughs> the languages don't work like that. Languages are different, you know, they have yeah. different structures. And different, so if you just put a Spanish expression into English, literally, word by word, then we'd crack up laughing. So yeah, I think absolutely. This, <laughs> yeah. I think this is a kind of, um, um, in, in massive, it has a massive potential, the idea of translating for creativity. Mm -hmm. My, I, I've often said that I think like in the Bible, the Tower of, the Tower of Babel, where it's about, it's about this, it's about creativity for me. Mm -hmm. Because here are some guys, they wanted to build this tower up to the sky. And, um, and God was angry and he said, okay, now for wanting to do that pretentious thing, I'm going to punish you and I'm going to make you all speak different languages so you can't communicate. Mm -hmm. So I kind of look on this like it's not a punishment, it's a gift. <laughs> <laughs> because if I, if I give you different languages, you're each going to have a different concept of the world. Yeah. Um, uh, Wittgenstein said something like the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Yeah. So you all mm. will have different limits different you're going to be living in different worlds and you have to work together maybe it's makes power building a bit more tricky 
but it does <laughs> more creative and it makes life much more fun. Yeah, so, but I mean, um, also when you when you work in different media, like you know, on the one hand, you work with clay, oil, you know, the paintings, and also you know, drawings and installation art, lights, multimedia. Um, it's also um, a constant translation in your brain that's going on because you have an idea and you have to kind of make that idea uh, express itself at its best in all sorts of different um, media. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So when you, if you're thinking in, in one medium, it, that I think that uh, neurologists say that languages are stored in different parts of your brain, especially mm -hmm. you have your mother tongue in one part and it, you have an acquired language in another part. So I think if you if you change media, as you say, if you go from clay to drawing or for designing on a computer for 3D printing and things like that, you're using a different part of your brain mm -hmm. because you're thinking in that language, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So then what I think the, the communication between these different parts of your brain in these different languages is where things start to get interesting. Mm -hmm. Something in drawing, but I want to do it in clay. I want to do it in volume in space. Yeah. So it's a completely different reality. Absolutely, and I know from our, you know, our long conversations <laughs> in the last years um, that you are you have a very open-minded conception and perception of creativity, and it is also something that you want to bring out to the world to more people. Um, you know, move them to what is inherently there and use it. Um, more. Um, let's talk about that a little bit because it's quite unusual for an artist to take the standpoint and say creativity is not a privilege, not an artistic privilege. It's something that uh, more people should be able to uh, live up to. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Apologies for the long conversation. It's oh, no. <laughs> I too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I love those. I mean, no, I've <laughs> yeah, well, you know me. I, you well, know, once um, I start. <laughs> but um, yeah, th this is what makes me. I think um, also what makes me make sense in somophilia for me hmm. is because my idea of creativity goes beyond what artists consider to be creativity is all about. The art world is very, I was going to say snobbish in a mm. way, like artists think that they are in possession of pure creativity and other people are in possession of applied creativity, which is an expression I've heard you use, which mm. I think is very, very intelligently uh, brought forward. And, and autos, but in a way, artists and art schools or art institutions, this may sound a little bit strange, but they're very conservative. <laughs> Explain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, art, art schools kind of go back a hundred years or something like that, and they were very avant-garde, mm -hmm. where people were put together and they could kind of um, bring their artistic and advanced ideas and then bring them out to society. But like everything, they become old fashioned. I mean, academies were very modern at one time, and then we realize academies are holding us back. Hmm. And in a way, art schools are holding us back because they don't want to mix with the rest of people who are working with creativity. They think hmm. art, is, hmm. art is pure art and should be left alone. And we should be have money thrown at us and just, okay, you guys do what you have to do. And this is just not working. So my, my obsession, I have, I've been an art, in a, a university professor for 20 years now, and my obsession in, in the art school, uh, together with uh, working on creativity and all this translation and things we've already talked about, is that our creativity, the creativity of people who are drawn to art schools, who have a very specific kind of creativity, can contribute to society beyond just being artists or being painters or sculptors or composers, uh, poets and things like that. This creativity can, creativity can be really useful to society. It can, mm -hmm. it can be a part of this world that's changing so rapidly, mainly uh, through technology. And we're missing out on it. Yeah. The artists are missing out in largely on what's really changing the world right now. A hundred years ago, artists changed the world. Right now, technology is changing the world. 
and mm. artists are looking and thinking, you know, what's going on? Mm. But also, I think the people in technology can benefit from the kind of creativity that we have. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in people in belonging to the art world, they, we are totally unrelated to business, for one. So if we have an idea and we think it's worthwhile, we just do it. Mm -hmm. This is the way I was educated. And, I, and this is the way I work. I don't think, is this going to make me any money or is anybody interested in this? Mm -hmm. I just go ahead and do it if I can, materialize it, and then we'll see. And I think this, this is something that people in technology can, can take advantage of. Let's just do it yeah. and then we'll see. I think there's so many amazing ideas have been abandoned. Mm. because there was nobody who thought that any money could be made out of mm. Well, it looks like science fiction has done a great job in those terms. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. In, in moving technology forward, in opening up some new, you know, imaginary um, uh, utopian landscapes or sometimes also dystopian landscapes, uh, some of which, um, you know, when you think about just Star Trek and things like that, uh, a lot of those things are becoming a reality one by one. Um, so, and, and but when we really go back and talk uh, and think about people like you know uh, um, someone like Da Vinci or you know um, uh, some of those great Renaissance artists, um, they seem to be so multifaceted too. Uh, I was just recently reading something that was really fascinating. Um, I think it's the British Library or uh, some of those big institutions who just published um, the online notebooks of Da Vinci um, where he says, you know, uh, where he had his to-do lists. And when we think about our to-do lists, you know, uh, it's like, do this, do that, do this, do that. Um, and his to-do list was, go find the best mathematician on, in, in Europe. Learn, I'll, you know, learn uh, arithmetics uh, from him and things like that. You know, so, so when you, you or, uh, you know, go find the best uh, uh, doctor in the country and uh, stay with him for a month and work with him for a month and learn things from him for a month and things like that. So so I, I was like, mm, I have to reconsider my to-do lists. I also have to mention once again in the middle of the uh, show that we have the MindShift TV on uh, Twitter for questions. Uh, so once it's getting really interesting, uh, people start uh, you know, throwing us uh, questions. Um, so what, what are your to-do lists look like? What, what do my to-do lists look like? Um, <laughs> Strangely, like Da Vinci's ones, I've never seen those to-do lists, but my to-do lists are always about, you because you said try and find the best mathematician or the best doctor or whatever, I'm always bugging people on my to-do list. <laughs> is, you know, and, and in fact, that's how you and I met. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I went and I bugged you over the internet. Okay, I think, okay, there's people all of a sudden who have a knowledge. And, <laughs> uh, and then the, the magic of the internet for me is that you can you can contact these people out of the blue. Yeah. And usually people who are doing interesting things are interested in people being interested in what they're doing. So it's, it's amazing, you can write to people. I've written to people all over the world, say, I'm really interested in what you're researching or what you wrote or blah, blah, blah. And, and let's try and have an exchange of ideas here. So my to-do list is mainly about people. Awesome. Yeah, people who can, um, who can maybe enrich what I, what I'm working on and hopefully maybe I can enrich something that they're working on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think well, what you said like, is really fascinating because Da Vinci obviously goes way back before um, romanticism and because in, in, in art, romanticism is uh, the romantic movement has had such a huge effect on Western culture that in, in yeah. a way it's, we still haven't got over it. So it's still this idea about the tormented romantic creator. And this has done, <laughs> uh, obviously it's produced amazing works of art. And, and it, but it's still today, people are still hanging on to this idea. Yeah, but why is it so? Why, why do we love, you know, it's not only when it comes to artists, also when it comes to inventors, when it comes to great business people, when it comes to, you know, startups and things like that. We love spinning stories, myths, 
Um, so and and I get I, I sometimes get really angry uh, and and even you know uh, I take it personally. <laughs> um, I'm almost personally offended when when people start uh, talking about geniuses and them and us. Um, yeah. And you know, do, doing this creative class versus not creative, and they are geniuses. They can do it, and we can't do it, um, because at the end of the day, it's like speaking, um, you know, as if as if they are denying us our capability, our innate capability of being at the same level. Only, um, I'm a true believer of this, and you know this. Only if we sit on our butts and do the freaking work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's for everybody. This is it. This is, the, the democracy has to reach creativity. Creativity yeah. is for everybody. But these ideas that some people are special and some people mm -hmm. are tormented and well even like I think there are quotes from Mozart and they'll say where where does all this music come from? And he'll say, well you know from above. <laughs> okay, so that end that's end of conversation. God is <laughs> sending music to you but it's not sending music to me yeah. so there's nothing you can do about it and all this because and also like characters like uh, Vincent van Gogh and which is who's an amazing artist but this he's obviously mentally ill mm. and, uh, and tormented and unhappy and committed mm. suicide we think and the people love this story as you say but that's only one kind of art yeah. And art is uh, irrational and is appealing to to the emotional um, mm -hmm. part of our intelligence. But art does not only appeal to emotional forms of intelligence; it also appeals to the rational. Mm -hmm. And usually, it will appeal somewhere in between, which is where most of us stand. You know, somewhere between reason and emotion is where we want to be, mm -hmm. and is where you're most likely to be happy. You don't want to be like Sheldon Cooper. That's well, actually like that's actually really interesting. You say this because um, you know when I think of art, when I think of interesting art, uh, maybe we live in interesting times. Um, yeah. When I when I think of works that are really fascinating, then I realize that um, there are so many layers of possible interpretations and. Uh, the more ex experience, the more you know. Um, also, knowledge you gather in the world, uh, the more the perspective changes on the on the artwork, and then you suddenly discover um, something that's totally that was totally not there when you looked at it ten years ago, right? Uh, exactly. uh, books like Madame Madame Bovary uh, of Flaubert, and you know some some music is like that, um, but. Is it, I mean, as an artist, tell me, is it really hidden in there somewhere or is it me? Is it really hidden? In the work. Does the artist consciously hide different interpretations uh, to appeal yeah. to different... Sorry, sorry. I had not understood the question. It's, <laughs> it's hidden in there, but I don't think it's hidden intentionally. Okay. Because if, if an artist, a true artist, has done a, a work of art, he or she has put endless thinking into it uh, prior to actually materializing it. And then when, while materializing it, then maybe modifications once it's been materialized. So there's a lot of layers, as you say, of thinking going into it. And some of this thinking is more rational because you're having a rational day. Some mm -hmm. of it's more emotional and some of it, most of it is somewhere in between. So then all these layers are there, but you don't really think, okay, this is going to be hidden. It's just that this kind of makes sense there, and let's. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to leave it there. I think there's a kind of, at least for me, there's a rational part where you create, where you have an idea. I think I'm, I'm quite rational in that sense. And then there's an emotional part where you look at your own, uh, your own creation, and think, well, this just doesn't make sense, but I don't <laughs> know why. As in, it doesn't make emotional sense, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you need both, and this is um, this is why I was uh, a couple of years back at Sonophilia. I remember I became very fascinated with the talk by by Khalik, who was mm -hmm. in in your kitchen here a week ago, and um, and his uh, the work that they were doing at Simanto with mm -hmm. artificial intelligence through psychology, which I found fascinating. 
because emotional intelligence, I think, because I've, I've been doing quite a bit of reading and thinking about how emotional intelligence can serve us. I mean, it can serve everything. I remember somebody at Sonophilia saying, just get anything there is in the world and put um, I, uh, IA next to it. Um, and a AI, sorry, I put it <laughs> Put AI, I don't think it makes sense. Put AI <laughs> next to it. And that's what we're going to have shortly in the near future. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just get anything, you know, like bread making, pizza, whatever, put put AI next to it, and that's what's coming. Mm -hmm. So what's mm -hmm. coming for us? Put AI next to it. So with and and then there was this talk by Kali Cassis, and he said that um he, he described the way they were using data to kind of go be ahead of consumers and, and not kind of think intuitively, what do I think people are demanding? But mm -hmm. actually know what people are demanding. And that's what I that's what we'll give them, what they want, and nothing else. But this mm -hmm. is amazing. And how could that be useful for an artist mm. because an, an artist is emotional and also rational but I think the rational part of that it could be really really useful because you could create images like we, we talked about translation and how I, I, I say to my students I say read a text and when you read inevitably you're going to form images in your in your mind mm. in your imagination that's imagination and image have the same root uh, this reading is about images. You, you read Madame Bovary, and you, she has a face, and Alphonse, I think, it was, mm -hmm. uh, her husband or lover or whatever. You, you create a face for him, and you create an image for his house and for her house, for her husband, and so on. So it's all about images. So reading, or language, should I say, and, and being a visual artist are totally related. Mm -hmm. So the way that artificial intelligence could find its way into visual art could be through language. This is something I've been working on. I know nothing about artificial intelligence, but I mm. kind of think Yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd love to kind yeah. of be able to pick, to pick somebody's brains, one of these people who do know about artificial intelligence. It's actually and, really interesting because okay. there are there are very interesting things happening at the at the realm of artificial intelligence and arts, um, you know, because it's a fascinating topic when mm. artists, uh, when technologists uh, try to prove that computers um, can be good strategic decision makers. Um, it's of course naive to yeah. think that they will leave out creativity because they want to understand, you know, uh, what is intuition, what is the process of creative thinking, um, and of course with that comes, um, you know, the possibility of emotional manipulation in the positive or, or, or as well as in the negative sense. Um, so these are all very interesting concepts uh, to computer scientists and it's interesting yeah. because then they create algorithms which start creating random, you know, images which uh, learn like the art schools teach, you know, they give a exactly. 500 years of, you know, masterworks to a computer and then tell it, you know, do something of your own. <laughs> so it's exactly, yeah. it's exactly how, you know, art schools, <laughs> art schools work or, or they give them a, a limitation or some, you know, some array of, of uh, mistakes and then the computer needs to come up with some random um, interesting things. So it's yeah. it's really fascinating right now. But when you uh, when you start really deeply discussing about AI and creativity in the uh, informed circles, uh, at some point comes the question about you know context awareness, uh, communicational intention. Um, you know, this human experience from human for other humans. Um, but if you don't know who created the art, why should you care? Yeah, and I guess there's also the idea of taste. Mm. You know, the idea of people saying, okay, I, I like this kind of art or I like this kind of music. Mm. So, but what is that exactly what, you know, that may seem kind of more human, more emotional. And one would think maybe computing can't appeal to the emotional. Mm -hmm. But then exactly what is taste? Because I've also, I was reading a book, I don't know if you uh, know, Daniel Kahneman. Yes, Thinking Fast like, and Slow. 
fast and slow, exactly. Yes, I was reading this a couple of months back. And um, and there's one place where he says people, and this is known by people who are in advertising and things like that, people will buy what they're familiar with. Ah. This is basically what advertising is based on. So, you know, mm -hmm. if I make you familiar with a, a product, then when you see it in the supermarket, you'll buy it. He said, this is based on a very primitive instinct that people will trust what they're familiar with. So you trust the people in your tribe because you know them and you're familiar with them, but you don't trust people who, who you've never seen before. And, <laughs> and this is applied to everything. And in a way, I think this could, this is not Daniel Kahneman, this is kind of one of my silly conclusions, is that <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe taste is also related to this. Taste, mm -hmm. you like what you're familiar with. So taste is not something so like difficult to to define. It's just familiarity. I, have, I actually have a kind of controversial question at this point. Because okay. when we think back about uh, you know artists um, from the Renaissance ateliers, for instance. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, we talk about Da Vinci, but we know that he employed like 50 people in his in his workshop. So we don't even know how much of the art is really from his hand um, yeah. versus, you know, um, so, so we have these big workshops where art is actually understood as more like a craftsmanship and artists is not necessarily a person who would want uh, you know, his name under everything, in certain things we don't even have that. And we know that they had patrons um, who had a certain taste and the artist was more or less, uh, a, 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 you know, like a service provider <laughs> um, yeah. who was who is doing extremely well-crafted um, artworks for his uh, patrons, which could be translated as... Um, individualized products so i can imagine that you know um but what for different reasons we totally broke with that kind of notion you know art serving a patron you know being an individualized thing so but ai might actually empower that again can, Bring it can, back. Yeah, exactly so would you so that would be the end of romanticism the yeah. romantic movement, because the romantic movement kind of took art away from this idea, like you say, doing a bespoke work of art for, for the person who wants it. I want an image of the Virgin Mary, but I want her to be wearing blue and blah, 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 and I want her to yeah. look like my yeah. mother, or whatever. <laughs> and then, so, um, <laughs> the Virgin Mary. <laughs> exactly. so, so, but in romanticism, all of a sudden, it, this the person who produces art isn't just a normal person who has a certain knowledge. It's somebody who's special yeah. in some kind of way, who has this sensibility. Somebody who's tormented. Somebody who wants to bring out the. I I, I detest the uh, the expression to express. Say artist artistic expression because that means to bring out something that's inside. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily think artists are bringing out things that are inside. They're just creating forms or or materializing things which are outside. And I've just maybe changed the forms or changed the order that they're in. And then now they exist and they're interesting to us or they communicate things to us. But this idea that there are certain kinds of people who have who are more intense feelings or emotions and, and they have a need to bring these emotions out, I think that's kind of dead in the water by now. <laughs> but yeah. But, but it hasn't been replaced with anything else. So it's yeah, kind of yeah. paddling along, you know, mm -hmm. going downstream, but maybe AI will finally put an end to it. Yeah, and it looks like a, it looks like a, you know, this, uh, yeah, I don't know how to, how to say it. And it, it, there is this yearning for uh, yeah. this type of, this type of tormented figure who is just better than all of us. Uh, how, by the way, better. How is your food doing? Yeah. How's your How's your food doing? Look, this is uh, mine. Oh, it looks much better now. Yeah, looks, this is now like a big chocolate chunk cookie. Okay. Yeah, that's it's really really good. It's good. Okay. Hmm? Okay. 
Yeah. This time I know it's good because I tried it before. <laughs> I'm just chopping the veg here. I'm doing oh my god, you're not even half. <laughs> I'm going pretty slow, but hey, no hurry. It's just no. chugging it nicely, like, like the romantic <laughs> movement. It's just chugging along. <laughs> exactly. No hurry with the curry. Enjoy no the conversation. The <laughs> you must never hurry the curry. <laughs> well, actually, we have a question here on Twitter. Oh, yeah. okay. So, how important are new technologies for your art? Ah, okay. How important are new technologies? In a technical sense, not very. Because <laughs> um, I've always ended up creating... I've done some stuff with 3D computers and things like that, but I've always ended up creating things with my hands. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm old fashioned. And also because I'm, I find that manipulating is uh, very uh, soothing and it's a very pleasant thing to do. And it makes my mind flow very nicely when you're manipulating the, uh, like clay or mixing paint and things like that. It's something which I actually like to do, but mm -hmm. obviously that's also familiarity. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, new technology has always been something that's been present in my life and in my interests. Like one of my favorite bands is, since I was an early teenager was Kraftwerk ah. because of this idea of, um, of applying technology to art and taking out this idea, that, well, take mm -hmm. the romantic idea totally out of music and just use the cold, feelings of uh, synthesizers and things like that. This is fascinating and it's something I've always tried to put into my work, but I've done it by hand. I've not really been, I, I, so to say, I've not had the patience <laughs> with computers and things like that. I, I'll, I'll try and then I think I'll have to hell with it. I'll just make it with my hands. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing a lot of 3D printing lately because also, um, because I work for Scott department we were sent home and told to carry on teaching but we also volunteered to do some work to, to try and contribute to the fight against the virus mm -hmm. so we've been printing these uh, headpieces for doctors and policemen and so on which you know it, so mm -hmm. they can have a full mm -hmm. transparent face mask so we started uh, uh, my boss and I we started 3d printing them him and his house and me and my house and I reached the point where I was just thought, you know, why don't I just 3D print one and make a silicon mold and then I can just inject, you know, so I go back to the good old fashioned manipulating and I can do those, they're taking me 10 minutes at a time. While 3D printing, you're doing all this messing about on the computer, then you look at it and it's going around yeah. and it's going around and it's going around. It's and actually, think, yeah, well, sometimes it's probably slightly counterintuitive, right? <laughs> It is, yeah. yeah. So in the end, just mold and some some polyurethane and just inject it, and voila, there you have them. So you can do one after another. Yeah. So that's manipulating, and it's something I, I always uh, insist that my students do is also manipulate and learn how to use tools and things like that, because it's in the origin of our like evolution as a species mm. using tools. So I think everybody should know how to use tools and have a toolbox. Yeah, isn't it one of the uh, primary things that differentiate us from a lot of the other uh, species? You know, yeah, the being, yeah, exactly. Being being yeah. able to use tools and being able to um, bring together people around the narrative to enable you know remote collaboration. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's not mine. That's Harari's. So one of my <laughs> one of my favorite. <laughs> philosophers um well you know we're heading towards the end of the show <laughs> and now comes not your not so favorite time part with the jokes <laughs> i really you know i'm really good at jokes and i always tell jokes to my students but i'm like <laughs> i'm stuck I've got no, no jokes. <laughs> You're stuck. Well, you know, if maybe maybe you will open up once you hear my my joke, and then you will okay. be like, it can't get it can't get worse than that. You should have warned me that there was a you you wanted a joke. Oh, uh, haven't I? Uh, I didn't know this. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's okay. Now, um, well, 
um, okay, then I'm going to tell the joke and then, um, you know, um, wait, but how does mine go? I'm also not very good at telling jokes. You probably realized, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not ashamed. Um, okay. Um, why are atoms Catholic? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> because they have a mass. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, I've got one too. Hey, excellent. <laughs> there's, um, there's two two goats and they're up in the Hollywood Hills and they, they've come <laughs> they've come across some old uh, reels of uh, celluloid films that somebody's thrown away. And um, so they're chewing on the on the celluloid of the films. And one goat looks at the other and he says, I preferred the book. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> this is Sorry, so no. good. <laughs> <laughs> this was really funny. That's <laughs> that awesome. Really well, actually, uh, uh, Simon, you also have to once again repeat the, your Thai curry recipe before we end. My recipe? Yes. For the Thai curry. Okay, so basically, you can't really go wrong with the Thai curry recipe because you can put all sorts of uh, <laughs> uh, vegetables in. So I've got onion, carrots, tomatoes, lime juice, uh, avocado, which you don't cook, but you, you cut and you put raw. On That's top. already more than three ingredients. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, stick to those three. And so you just cook it. Put in the curry, put in the coconut milk, and, and then, then serve with rice. Actually, there is one last question here. Very interesting. Okay. Very difficult. Try oh, to keep it short. Yes. This is, is post-joke question. This is well, yeah. It's getting serious again. You will have to tell another joke probably. Um, okay. Simon, would art change if we ever found a way to measure creativity and build machines with, with measurable creativity? about that of humans? Would art change? Well, I think the only thing you can say for sure about art is that it's always changing. Mm -hmm. Like just I, like the world. So art will change whether we do that or not. But, uh, but of course, if we can measure creativity, that would eliminate the need for special people. Mm -hmm. So basically, that would turn everybody into a potential artist because we know that technology is creating uh, media and means for producing anything. Sculptures, paintings, you name it, they will be produced by, they, they already can be produced by 3D printers and by printers and plotters and things like that. So art will change. And if creativity can be measured, then we don't need the special person to have the idea to put into that machine so then this art will change and art will be everywhere. So it will change, it will change radically, I think, yes. Mm. But uh, it'll, it, art's always been like a mirror to the world. So it will change, I guess, at the same pace that the world is changing. Mm. So the world can look at, uh, look at art and see itself in a modified way. Mm. So I think art has to change so it can send back the image to the world of what the world really is. Mm. So yes, I would say art has to change. Yeah, I, I think that's a very, very good closing. Um, I'm going to now switch you back. Okay. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> well done. Simon, you hang on the line uh, because we will have a, a short after show party with you <laughs> while you're still cooking to the end. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, I think this was really very insightful. Uh, as I said, this is the week of arts at, uh, at the Mindshift TV. Uh, we had already three very uh, fine artists and cultural entrepreneurs. Tomorrow we have a magician on the show. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I'll and <laughs> well, let's hope he doesn't disappear. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to also uh, tomorrow's episode with Dan Berlin. Um, let me switch to my solo scene to say goodbye to everyone at the other end of the line. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm looking forward to welcoming you back here uh, tomorrow night at 9 p.m. on our late live stream at the Entrepreneur's Kitchen. Stay tuned. Bye-bye and have a good night.